This is a paid message from White Boy Black Girl, a new book from Adaisy and Chad Brinkman. White Boy Black Girl is an open-handed invitation from Adaisy and Chad to learn what our differences can teach us, one honest conversation at a time. Their honest back and forth throughout the book gives us common, usable language to meet each other where we're at. Let the awkward conversations begin. For more information, go to Tyndale.com. Then I had to navigate being what I thought at the time was the only Pentecostal woman. Everyone else was evangelical. I had to walk through being the only one with the knowledge to talk about racial issues. Mm -hmm. I was the first black friend for most people on my team. Mm -hmm. Except for like one. And I was just like, I don't understand that. I've had white friends forever. How have you never had a black friend? This is Where You're From, an origin story podcast at the intersection of faith and culture that digs into the influences and experiences that shape who we are today. Join us as we gain insight into the Bible's wisdom for all, regardless of where we're from. Hey, y'all, this is Rasul Berry. Thanks for joining me on Where You're From. This week, I want to share my conversation with Danielle Mark. Danielle is the president of the Witness Foundation and an emerging leader in the nonprofit sector with over 10 years of experience. She is an alumna of Westchester University and holds a certification from the Yale School of Management, specializing in fostering diversity and inclusion. We are excited to share Danielle's story and the Voices partnership with the Witness Foundation. We had a little trouble with our recording this time, but not enough to stop us from sharing Danielle's inspiring story. You can find out more about Danielle Mark, the Witness Foundation, and Voices by clicking on the links in the show notes or by visiting whereyou'refrom.org. That's where, Y-A, from, dot O-R-G. Please join me as I ask Danielle Mark, where you're from. Where am I from? Oh, great place to start. So I grew up 30 seconds away from an Amish farm hmm. in Pennsylvania, Honeybrook, right? Yep. But I went to school in Coatesville, which is a hmm. small city outside of Philadelphia. And so I spent most of my days going back and forth between a small town that had an active KKK chapter, 30 hmm. second walk from an Amish farm to a school that was an urban area where my ethnicity was very well represented everywhere that I went outside of the teachers. And so that was interesting to learn how to navigate that going back and forth. Well, first, shout out to Southeastern Pennsylvania, you know, where we yeah. both hail in the Philly <laughs> area. So That's my right. school used to play against Coatesville. So, you know, really? I remember. Yeah, yeah. We would go wow. out there. Yep. Okay. So I, I definitely can remember and know that kind of semi-urban, semi-rural mm -hmm. dynamic. So, so right. tell me a little bit about what that was like and how did you mm -hmm. feel some of the contrast between yeah. this kind of rural and urban experience? So there's like the surface level things, you know, so you see the horse and buggy and people dressed in all black and, you know, the hats and, you know, you're driving by in your car and looking out and seeing, oh, well, the horse is taking care of their business as they walk along their path. You know, that's different. We don't do that. We drive in our cars. You're not allowed to take pictures of them. Mm -hmm. So if you go out with the camera and you try to take pictures, they will make sure that you exit promptly. Mm -hmm. You know, so those are just some surface um, level things. But then also you have those deep embedded things where you go into town and you experience people giving you rude glares. Mm -hmm. And as a child, you ask your parents, why are they looking at us like that? Mm -hmm. Why don't we go back to that laundromat anymore? Mm -hmm. Also having to turn out our lights at certain times of the day. And during certain times of the year, it became clear to us as we got older that there were people that did not want us in that area and they were going to be very loud about it. Are we talking about the Amish still or are we talking about other people? We're talking about the area where the Amish inhabited, but not the Amish people. We're talking okay. about the people in the rural area. Got you. And we say turn out the lights at certain points. Why would you have to turn out the lights at certain points? Yeah. So we had an active KKK chapter. Right. And so sometimes they would go on parade, 
And we had a neighbor who even had a cross that was lit up in her front yard. Mm. And so when my parents found that out, we were one of two families that lived there, Black families. You know, that was hard for all of us to hear that that was happening. So in order to protect us, my parents would go out of their way to make sure that all our lights were cut off and that we were inside and no one was going anywhere so that they wouldn't find out where we lived. Gotcha. So they didn't know who lived there. If they if you had the lights on and you walk by, they go, mm-hmm. oh, that's where the black family lives. And then right. there could be trouble. Man, that's right. a mm-hmm. unnerving thing to to experience. Yeah. And that was in the 90s. Wow. Wow. So you would go from that kind of context. And then you said to a school where it was normal to see people like you. Yeah. You know? So tell us yeah. a little bit about the school environment. Yeah. So I went to school in Coatesville. Mm-hmm. Coatesville is a small city. And I think it mirrored some of the things in Philly that were both fun, but also challenging. So Mm -hmm. we had like some poverty there. As I grew older, my friends would tell me stories about living in the project, Mm -hmm. which was like one street, but it still had a significant impact. So you had people whose uncles and fathers and mothers or aunties, sisters were in prison and they were acclimating to life without them being present physically. So I heard a lot of the challenges that my people were facing in an urban environment while I had my own challenges in a rural environment. And it impacted our education and how we got along with each other and our dynamics between white people in the school because it was split pretty much almost 50-50. So that really fostered in me a desire to want to give back to my people. And Mm -hmm. so the journey really started there. Gotcha. And so tell, tell us a little bit about your family situation. Yeah, yeah. So I'm a double PK. Oh. I'm a double. Yep, not one but two. <laughs> okay. And three generations. So my grandfather was and is a pastor. My father and my uncle, they were both in pastoral ministry when I was growing up. And my mother was a minister at the local Chester County prison. So she would go there and minister and also minister to women in our uh, local community. So I was surrounded by ministers everywhere. So I felt the pressure to be a good, (laughs) a good kid. I love the Lord myself, but I felt the pressure, you know? Right. So, you know, it sounds like in some ways you experienced the blessing of Mm -hmm. that kind of ministry rich environment and commitment, but you also felt some of the pressure. Let's talk about both sides of that. Like, what was the blessing? What were the ways in which you look back on that and you're grateful or Mm. you see the benefits and the fruit of that legacy from your parents? Yeah. Yeah. I, I see a big legacy in the sense of when I was younger, about five years old, I gave my life to the Lord because we were in church every Sunday. So I was always hearing the gospel, the good news that Jesus loved me and he cared about me, that I could be in friendship with him and the work that he did on the cross and, you know, all those good, rich things. And so I gave my life to the Lord when I was five. And then I spent a lot of my young years with my mom learning to pray, Mm -hmm. pray for people, not just for me, but pray for people, pray for my community, pray for the world and to try to be a light to those mm-hmm. around me. And I saw my mom model that so well. And then I would sit in youth class and my father was the teacher. So I was getting taught and also seeing prayer modeled and what it looked like to be a community citizen and an ambassador for Christ. So I'm grateful and, for that. And that's really significant when the external public persona matches the private. And yeah. it seems like that happened. So it was reinforcing because, you know, a lot of PKs, you know, that's where it goes sideways, right? When they see yeah. a difference. It, it almost feels like y'all can be somewhat of a little fraternity sorority, right? Of people <laughs> who like are experienced being a pastor's kid. Tell us a little yeah. bit about that dynamic. Have you experienced that kind of camaraderie <laughs> with yeah. other PKs? Yeah, yeah. I would <laughs> say I have, you know, especially growing up because my home wasn't perfect. You know, right. great example, but no home is perfect. And when you have that kind of pressure, yeah. Yeah. it's just not going to be perfect. But there were other friends of mine in the Coastal community who also had fathers that were ministered. So they'd be like, Danielle, you want to come to this party with us? And I'd be like, 
no, I want to go home and read my Bible. <laughs> or I want to go play basketball because mm-hmm. basketball was my thing. And then I would sing at some of the churches. Okay. You know, that my father gotcha. was preaching at or my mom was preaching at. So there was that opportunity to meet others that were like right. me. And when you talk about the pressure, was where was that pressure coming from? Like, mm. and what is that pressure? Pressure to do what? Pressure to be what? Yeah. Yeah. Pressure to be perfect, mm. you know, to not make any mistakes. Mm. And so I think part of that came internally mm. because I like to get things right. And then also I really loved the Lord. So I wanted to make the mm. Lord happy with my life. So I think right. that was sincere. And then there's also the element of community members asking you and vetting you to see if you're real. Got you. And that has its own emotional weight. Right. And the sense in which, because I experienced this as being a pastor, seeing it with my daughter, being a missionary, mm-hmm. and she was a missionary kid. Like yeah. sometimes I, I felt like the weight of other people's expectations on her to be perfect, almost like they're an extension of you as a leader. Yeah. And then they police your yep. behavior in ways that is very intense sometimes. Mm-hmm. I see you nodding, you know, so yep, you've experienced it. this. <laughs> it's the policing of behavior. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Got you. Yeah. So, but in the midst of all that, you talked about just still growing and still loving, you know, being in church. What were some things yeah. you loved about church? Yeah. So I would say, if you imagine the Black Pentecostal church yep. and a Baptist church focused on getting out the traditional message of the gospel and you put those two together, Mm-hmm. That was my church. Okay. So it was speaking in tongues, you know, praise breaks. But then the pastor always preached about Jesus and Jesus coming down and dying on the cross for our mm-hmm. sins. You know, that was like the main thing he was always preaching about every Sunday. Mm-hmm. So the two really gotcha. combined to make a unique experience. Yeah. But it's like the cross of this significant thing that happened in the past that is the centering moment in human history. But then there's also like, God is still speaking. It's not like yes. he retired. Like it's still vibrant and you can still sense yes. his presence and be filled with his spirit. And so you get kind of all of that combined. Yes. Yes. Now, did you have uh, siblings? Yes. So I have a brother who is like a year and a half younger than me. Oh, so not only were you a PK, but you had an older sister too. I was right? the older <laughs> sister too. <laughs> so then you had to really, really get right. Oh, um, yep. It's just... <laughs> Now, you also talked about basketball. Okay, I, now this yeah. is an aspect that, you know, tell us a little bit about your hoop dreams. Yeah. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. You know, that was my main dream. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be in the WNBA. Okay. I wanted to play for UConn because Diana Taurasi played there. So I was yep. like, I want to go, go where she was. Yeah. And then I went to play on Liberty Okay. I saw Dawn Stanley on Liberty. So I, I already had this all mapped out. So mm-hmm. you, you know how it is when you're a kid. So yeah. I got to high school and I still had this dream. But I said, you know, I'm 5'2". I don't know how I'm going to make this happen. <laughs> and even though others have made it happen, I was sure. like, I don't know if I'm on that level yet. So when I got to 10th grade, I was like, you know, I think it's time for me to look to other things. Mm. So I started looking at music and ministry. That's a pretty mature decision to make. I mean, what do you think, as you look back on yourself now, what do you think that that moment and that decision tells us about Danielle mm-hmm. in high school? Like who you are in your essence, that you would think about that and go, you know, I'm better suited for something else. That's a great question. And I've never thought of it that way. I think what it says is that there's a dreamer element of me and a practical element. Mm -hmm. And if I don't see things working out strategically, I'm going to pivot. Because I don't like to play with people's time, Uh, including mine. Including. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, because, yeah, that is uncommon. Like, you know, that on your own, like you didn't, you know, you were like, I think it's wise for me to do something else. And so with some of that, you talk about music and ministry. The ministry side, you've already talked about, you know, you saw it all around you, modeled and whatnot. Tell us a little bit about the music. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, growing up as a good PK, (laughs) I sung gospel Mm -hmm. and gospel was all I listened to. Mm -hmm. And so I started off leading worship once I got in my teen years. I was also starting to lead worship and getting invited to sing at different churches and banquets and things like that. And so people that I love was like Yolanda Adams. C.C. Wyman. And then as I got exposed to more artists, it was like Whitney Houston. She became a favorite of mine and some others. And so 
as I've gotten older, I branched out more into sharing more stories with God being the center, but also talking about what it means to be in love, what it means to experience heartbreak, you know, as a young Christian woman, because I think okay. those are important topics. First of all, I just noticed, I just got to say, you're, you're, you have some immaculate tastes. You, you know, you talked about your role models first in basketball being Diana Taurasi and Dawn Staley, <laughs> two of the great, you know, <laughs> shout out to Dawn amazing. Staley, Philadelphia yeah. native, just yeah. won the championship in NCAA, right? And then you Yo. just switch over to music and you're like, uh, Whitney Houston, CC Wine is right. <laughs> Only like two of the best. So you got an eye and an ear for for those things. So you kind of make this pivot not only to music but ministry and and high school. And then, yeah, what does that look like? What are your aspirations when you graduate? And like, what's going to be the next chapter? What is that going to look like for Danielle? Yeah. So when I graduated high school, what that transition to college looked like was kind of rough. Because I anticipated going straight to a four-year. And then I ended up having to go to community college because my test scores weren't what they needed to be. Mm. So that was a confidence bomb. Mm. But it did give me time to explore more music and to do ministry just in regular life. And I loved it because growing up Pentecostal, uh, we really connect to the prophetic. Mm -hmm. And so that was something I had space to exercise without feeling pressure. And so going into the four-year institution, when I transitioned, I started doing Bible studies and prayer nights. And then I ended up after college looking to do some more collegiate mentorship and evangelism. And so I really treasure both years at college, both university and community college for giving me that space to find my voice in ministry and what I actually really wanted to do. I'm so glad that you were open about that reality because that's something that a lot of times people don't talk about, right? That process of having a different outcome than what you were expecting, Mm. going to community college first. What do you feel like that did for you internally? Mm, It was humbling Mm. because I was a golden child in my school. I was homecoming queen. I was student council president. I was the Mm. honor soloist. The list goes on and on and on. And so for that person to not be able to get into a public four-year institution, Mm. it had the potential to be embarrassing. But it humbled me because I said, I can either go somewhere I don't want to go so it can look good. Mm. And I can say I'm going to a four-year institution, but pay all this money. Or I could go to a two-year college, pay less money save and hope to apply again to get into the school I really want to get into. And so I decided to go to the See, 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 there's that, there's that, that logical (laughs) wisdom again popping up, right? You know, just like, okay, you put down the hoop dreams. And so now you're pivoting and saying, look, I know I could do this to save face, but I'm going to go for the goal. And what were you holding out for? Yeah, I wanted to be a teacher. Okay. I really wanted to be a teacher and go back to my high school. Mm. And the principal at the time, I told him my dream, and he, and he said, you come back here in four years, and I'll give you a job. Wow. But what I didn't know is that I really didn't like it as much as I thought I would. Okay. Yeah. So because of that, you wanted to go to a school that was really strong at teaching. You Chester know, so University. Mm-hmm. West Chester, and that's, that's <laughs> the, the gold standard in the area. You that's know, right. For teaching. So you were really focused. Okay. So yeah. you get this, you know humbling experience, but also this grounded experience. Mm -hmm. And what would you say that those two years of having more, I guess, connection to the community of doing this Mm -hmm. kind of work of Bible study and other types of ministry prayer nights, how did that prepare you to be, you know, more equipped once you did end up going to Westchester? Yes, that one helped me to start to wrestle with some of my unresolved trauma that I had from being a PK and just, Mm. you know, my own walk as a person. And so I got to work through that as well as really being obedient to the voice of God. Like God Mm. would drop things in my spirit and I would humbly approach people and say, you know, I I think God is telling me this to tell you. I don't know if that's true, Mm. but can I just share it with you? And people would have tears in their eyes. Like I was just thinking about that or I was just wondering if God was real. So I had these real experiences Mm. with God and with people 
seeing how one word and one moment, one act of obedience can really change somebody's life. And I wasn't in charge of that change. I was just in charge of doing my part. I think about in Luke 16, verse 10, where Jesus says, whoever can be trusted with very little can Mm. also be trusted with much. Mm. And part of the things I saw is just the trust of, I'm not going to do what would help me save face or what other Mm. people expect, but I'm going to actually do what I sense God is calling me to. I think that that's being faithful Mm. with a piece that then entrusts you with more revelation. Because then I know that you're not going to use that revelation for your own benefit, but you're going to use it for what I call you to. So, Amen. I love that. Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. And this is when we, I think we met around the time you were in Westchester. I think so. Yeah, towards the tail end of Westchester. So I think we met around my third year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So you get the degree. Mm -hmm. Now, was that in education still? So I actually pivoted. Okay. And I like to tell this story for others that may be like me out there. I had to take a test in Westchester in order to get into the program officially. I failed that test three times by like one point. Mm. And no matter how much help I got, I couldn't get there. Now, I don't think that was God's will for my life to be a teacher in that element. So it's okay. Mm. It was a redirect back to him, which I'm so grateful for. But just because you're not excelling in one area doesn't mean you're not intelligent. Just may not be your area of expertise when it comes to intelligence. So it's great that you're able to see that and yet at the same time realize, well, God was still sovereign in the midst of redirecting me. And that's where God was like, you never saw me about what I wanted you to do. Oh. You just pursued your plan B instead of asking me for my plan A for your life. And I said, okay, so what's your plan A? And so he's like, I want you to do ministry. And I was like, how? All I've heard of is, First name, last name, international ministries. And that's <laughs> right. Cause I grew up Pentecostal. Right. You know, so that's what I heard of. And then I got exposed to a missionary organization a couple months later because of obedience. And I had never, it never clicked that that could be an avenue for me to do ministry through. So that wow. was a key part of my you, story. God's plan A was yeah. different than. Any other plan that we have is plan B. That That's, yes. that's a word. <laughs> okay. So once again, the pivot occurs. This is the theme that we're seeing. Yep. Love so the pivot. <laughs> what does that look like for you? Yeah. Yeah. So for me, that looked like talking to the local director there. And they were so kind to me because I didn't take the traditional path. Mark and Kim Huff invited me to their home. What I didn't know is that they had heard about the prayer groups that I was doing at my mm. apartment. Mm-hmm. And then I also did like a yearly Easter service. That was like an outreach service. And I invited my Pentecostal pastor, you know, to come and preach. And, you know, we had a whole three hour service, <laughs> you know. So I did that with some friends and they invited me to be a part of the ministry. And I said, well, I have a job offer on the table that's willing to pay me instead of me raising my support. So I need to think about this. Mm-hmm. That Saturday, like three days later, I run into a pastor friend of mine, long story short, He's like, what are you doing after you graduate? I said, I don't know. I have a couple ideas. And he said, yeah, well, you know, when I graduated, I knew that God was calling me to ministry, but I said no. And I took a different job that November. And then he called me to walk away from it three months later. And I was supposed to start that job in November. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm going home and I'm applying. And after I applied, I looked at my mom and I said, this is crazy. I don't know why I'm doing this, but this is what I believe God is leading me to do. This makes no sense whatsoever to me because I didn't like the organization. (laughs) That's (laughs) why I never joined. Right. So I was like, why are you calling me to something I don't like? Okay. So, so yeah, that's when you know, when it's like, this is not my plan. This is, this is definitely coming from above. Mm -hmm. And so you apply and what's next? Yeah. I apply, I get in, I start to raise my support. And what I didn't realize God was doing was preparing me for the position that I would have years later at The Witness. Mm. Mm. And so, though I had done some fundraising things as a child, I did the Joe Corby's pizza and the popcorn tin, you know, so I loved going out and doing that. But this was different. I was inviting people to be a part of a movement and inviting them to be a part of a work uh, that was spiritual and eternal. 
And so I'm grateful for that because it did prepare me for mm. something that I love doing. I wake up and I'm excited to be mm. a part of the work we do at The Witness. That's so cool. That's so cool. Okay. So I know personally, firsthand, the fund development, ministry partner development, fundraising <laughs> life is no joke. And it's also yes. one of those scenarios that God oftentimes uses to clarify direction. Yeah. So like, how long did you Absolutely. do that? Did it actually go to completion or was there another pivot before that? Yeah. Yeah. So I raised my initial support and was able to report to campus yeah. that fall. And I saw that people were passionate about that. And I learned how to communicate my story. Mm. And so I did a couple years at Westchester, helped us grow our movement to be more diverse while I was there. So I saw a lot of changes happen in our main meeting and they made a lot of adjustments so that we could be open to everyone, including the gospel choir ministries, where they had been meeting on the same night for 33 years. We mm. changed our meeting Wow! so that they could come. And so I started seeing that there are allies that you can trust, mm. you know, and I started to gain respect for the people around me and to open my eyes and open my heart and also ask God to help me have discernment because the battle is spiritual. Mm. Then I got even more involved in impact, which mm. is part of our connection too, and yeah. really focused on developing Black Christian leaders at Westchester and then eventually Cheney before I moved on to Philadelphia. All right. So the, the movement's yeah. happening and you're sensing the sense of equipping and when did mm your awareness of and passion for, you know, understanding this history and seeing its relevance to the Great Commission and, mm. and the movement of God? When did that start to take root for you? Mm. I think it started to take root for me when I started working for the missionary organization. Okay. okay. Because I didn't understand what the big deal was. I'm like, of course, everybody can hear God's voice and operate in the prophetic. How? Why would you not want to? Right. And then I noticed that there was a story behind some of that for people. Mm. And I had to actually work through, how do I respect God and respect his people at the same time? How do I navigate this? Because it's not the same freedom mm. and it's not the same invitation to come fully. And that was tough. So I had to deal with being the only black woman and black person on my team mm. for the first year. And I had never experienced anything like that in ministry. Mm. Ever. Then I had to navigate being what I thought at the time was the only Pentecostal woman. Mm. Everyone else was evangelical. I had to walk through being the only one with the knowledge to talk about racial issues. Mm. I was the first black friend for most people on my team, mm. except for like one. And I was just like, I don't understand that. I've had white friends forever. How have you never had a black friend? So like navigating all of those things were very new to me. And I think that's when it all converged. That's a lot of weight to, to be carrying at how old were you at this time? 23. 23. Yeah, that's a lot of weight yeah. for a 23 year old to be thinking through how do I simultaneously thrive mm -hmm. and do my work in this space, but also help and encourage and even challenge mm -hmm. the space to be mindful of the fact that there are some blind spots that are here and that mm -hmm. are preventing people like me from entering in this space mm -hmm. while at the same time we're colleagues and we work together while at right. the same time I come from a different <laughs> tradition. And so there are right, things right. that you just assume to be the case that I don't see the same way. And all, right. yeah, so yeah, that is a unique anointing to be walking <laughs> in. I mean, how did you get through all that? The Lord. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. like, cause I was still finding my voice. Right. So there was still a very reserved people pleaser, you know, and mm. I still, you know, struggle with that today, but it's different because I'm older, but I didn't want to say the wrong thing. I wanted to be respectful mm. where I came from, you know, black church, there's, you know, pastor, you don't say anything to pastor unless mm -hmm. he asks for your opinion. Why would you mm. volunteer? And I'm mm -hmm. sitting here like, why are y'all volunteering things? You know, people wow. speaking sarcastically. And I'm like, are you trying to come from my throat? 
Mm. I had to tell somebody one day, I said, those are fighting words to me. So if you don't want to fight me, I need you to talk to me differently. <laughs> I, I, I love it because you are, it's like you're this unique combination of very sweet, soft person, but this prophetic edge to it is like, I also stand on business though. Like yeah. I am still from Philly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's going to cut my surroundings. How I grew up is good because I still had to survive there. Like though right. I am, you know, sweet. I think that's a part of my personality. Like yeah. I talked my way out of a lot of fights and scenarios mm. growing up, even though mm. I was still the church girl mm. that didn't mm. make me immune. Right. So you serve in that space for a couple of years, incredibly intense. It sounds like in some ways formative, both for the type of resistance that mm. you got strengthened in, right? Because that's what it yeah. takes for us to build muscle, right? Yeah. But then also in finding your voice. So in that scenario, like what was the indication that it was time maybe to pivot to another season? When we come back, Danielle Mark will share how she pivoted into music, sacred and secular, and how in God's beautiful providence, these and other threads were woven together to prepare her to be the president of the Witness Foundation. That's coming next on Where You're From. This episode is brought to you in part by Seattle's Union Gospel Mission. Over 16,000 people in the greater Seattle area are homeless. Sherry is one of many who found a new life through Seattle's Union Gospel Mission. I was a treatment queen. I stayed clean for maybe six months, and then I started using again. And I kept doing that for 20 years until I was 43. At that time, I was in an abusive marriage, and I needed to find a way out. So I leaned on God, and God delivered me to the mission. The mission gave me a safe place to live and the therapy I needed to overcome my addiction. I learned how to speak up for myself, how to set boundaries, and be in a healthy relationship. Today, I'm helping people in recovery find the resources they need to start a new life, just like God and the mission has helped me. God is at the center of my life today. And grace will lead. Inspired, volunteer, or donate at UGM.org. Hey, y'all, before we get back to my conversation with Danielle Mark, I want to share a quick teaser from our next episode with Dr. Nicole Martin. This is where you're from. In high school, I had to have a foot surgery. And a few days after surgery, I went to see the doctor and I had gotten an infection in my foot. And I remembered it started out with pain and fevers. And my mom was like, I think I need to take you to the doctor. We went to the doctor. The doctor kind of whispers to my mom. And I heard my mom say, no, 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 we don't need an ambulance. I'll take her right now. I was like, what is going on? So my mom, trying to remain calm, says, we have to take you to the emergency room. You have to have surgery now. And she said, there's a chance they may have to remove your foot. Now I'm in high school. I was... In 10th grade at this time, I was a palm. So, you know, I danced at halftime. I was, I was the stuff. I was pretty popular by then. I had learned how to conceal my faith just enough to, you know, make my friends happy and get invited to a few parties. And I remember going to the hospital and thinking, my whole life is going to change. Now, let's get back to our conversation with Danielle Mark on where you're from. Yeah, so... I had a major shift in my life where I was supposed to get married and I ended up not being able to get married to that person. And it's fine. You know, everything's cool, but it was a challenge and mm. another pivot moment, right? Wow. Where I was like, I don't feel like I'm thriving anymore. Mm. What's next? Mm. And I had a mentor and she was like, you know, I see that there's this opening at the witness, you know, would you want to apply for it? And I was like, I'm not sure. I don't know if I'm good at communications. You know, that's how I'm thinking of it. And I said, I'm just going to apply anyway. I apply and meet with a Dr. Reverend Shannon Polk. She was the president at the time of the Witness Foundation. She asked me a few questions. Got to know a little bit more about my background. And saw that I had experience in fund development and really wanted to help me walk that out. And as I spent time with her, she helped me realize that there's not a lot of Black women in the fund development space mm. and encouraged me to really embrace that. And so I did. And I really leaned into it and found that it was something that felt very natural to me. 
to mm-hmm. be a voice on behalf of causes that I believe in. Man, that's that's beautiful. And we're going to pick that back up in a little bit. But I got to pick up on a thread that we kind of just let go, <laughs> you know, because there were two things that yeah. you said there was a calling for in high school. Ministry is one. We yeah. then ran down that lane. <laughs> but then there was this other thing, uh, mm-hmm. Miss Inspired by Whitney Houston and <laughs> CC Winans, this music thing. What yeah. happened with that during the same time period? Yeah. So I still do music, actually. So between the time of being a child and entering adulthood, I had a teacher that overheard me singing in class. And she asked, who is that singing in class? And I got scared because I thought I was in trouble. And I didn't like getting in trouble. Mm -hmm. And I slowly raised my hand. I was like, it was me. I'm sorry. She said, sing what you're singing. So I started singing Amazing Grace again. And she took an hour to have me sing for every teacher that she could stop and pause for. And then took me to the music teacher. And she said, you're going to be the honor soloist when when it's your year. What grade were you in? I was in third grade. Wow. Shy. Wouldn't open my mouth for anything. So when I talk about finding my voice, it's really been a journey. They sent me to the psychologist multiple times because I wouldn't talk. That's how bad it was. Right? Mm. And so through music, I was able to find my voice. Mm. And so I got put in singing lessons, got put in chorus. Twelfth grade, I was able to be the honor soloist. That felt like a fulfillment of prayer Mm. uh, that were prayed and, you know, investment from my community. And then after I graduated, I did a project under my middle name called Coming Out of Egypt. And that was my way of starting to deal with some of just my own personal challenges. And so I did that project, graduated from college and put out a project called The Odyssey, another journey project. But that was my first one that was R&B and pop, where I was exploring different themes of life, loss, and the Lord. Okay. So you do that and then you have another project. And so what's the next step? And then that one is my pivot. That's the project where I said, I feel like God won't leave me alone about singing about other stuff. And that may feel weird for some people. Like, how can God nudge you to sing about love and heartbreak? But I felt like God was calling me to be honest in a new way. Mm. And so that's where I started writing about the beauty of falling in love. And that was actually written from the perspective of being a believer and what it's felt like for God to have left such an impact on my life. But for most people, they heard it and thought I was writing about a a, a human person. I was like, no, I'm actually writing this about the Lord. So it was a great conversation piece Mm -hmm. when I was going out and singing this song. In okay. secular spaces. So it was my little way of evangelizing, but in a palatable way at someone else's pace. And so that project was called The Odyssey, and I did that under my current moniker, Danny Peace. And so you've been a little busy recently under this yes. moniker, of Danny Peace. Tell us about that and the songs and the journey. Yeah, yeah. So I'm really grateful whenever. I try to go back to gospel. I can see the difference of my impact versus when I just Mm -hmm. stay more in the secular realm with music, if you will. I see that God blesses it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because that's my area of courage. Mm -hmm. I have to trust God with that and have faith. And so he's allowed me to open for different artists like Ashanti, Ja Rule. You just took me back to the early 2000s. (laughs) But that's Ashanti, Ja Rule, you know. Yeah. Yeah, people but I used then, to speak and listen to, you know, <laughs> turn on my little radio back then, I could right. turn on my little radio. Um, Keith Sweat, SWV, Tyrese, Jay Holiday. Wow. Just a whole host of people I've gotten to share stage with. And that's just been a blessing. And those doors keep opening. Mm-hmm. I had a chance to go to the, the 66th annual Grammy, wow. you know, and walk the red carpet and meet different people there. Mm-hmm. And... I just think that God wants me in that space. He keeps affirming that he wants me to be a witness for him there and to enjoy the journey of becoming. Yeah, that's so good. And that journey of becoming, I just see this beautiful parallel between that teacher at third grade that said, who was that (laughs) singing? And then taking you 
literally classroom to classroom so that other people could hear this beautiful voice. And then God being like, let me show you this person. Let me take you to the most established venue mm-hmm. possible, the Grammy Awards, the, the most yeah. highly venerated. And I want y'all to see my daughter <laughs> on this space and what she can do. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm so grateful to God for that because there's two things. There's the, I've always dreamed of this and I knew it was possible. And then there's the, like, I never thought I could get to that place. And I think I've lived somewhere in the middle. God has given me glimpses of where he wants to take me. Some of them I've seen come to pass. Some are still yet to come. But there's always that element of we have to trust him. And we have to believe mm-hmm. that what he says is going to happen. Mm-hmm. And whether we believe it or not, there are things that God's going to make happen anyway. But there's a beautiful, intimate invitation that he gives us to trust mm-hmm. him. And I feel like every day I wake up, I'm presented with that choice to continue mm-hmm. to trust him and to continue to believe. And even if I get off the horse for a second, jump back on and it's more beautiful than the dream to me. Mm, the process, the journey. It's the journey. And yeah. I have to say, I think that's why God keeps opening these doors, because that is the central key insight that we can mm. often get caught up with. If I am too focused or distracted on right. the result and not the process of becoming that God is doing, right? That's mm-hmm. Romans eight twenty eight. All things work together. For those who love God, who've been called according to his purpose, because those who he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. (laughs) And that conforming is the, see, people stop at the part where, you know, all things work together for the good that love God. And then that's the result. Right. But it's the forming us into Jesus. That is the thing. Yeah, it Mm. is. Because it's that forming that makes us more like him and where we find joy. And peace. Mm-hmm. And I notice when I get off track and I don't stay focused on him, I start to experience lots of that. But that's what's sustaining. Okay. So I'm, I'm feeling this contrast, a, a, a tension in you, right? Because, you know, Little Miss 5'2", point guard, I'm too small to, to play basketball, has all of this in you. There's, you know, ministry, fun development, songs, red carpets. And that's not even all of it, right? We haven't even talked about this whole business CEO, founder, mogul part of you as well. So yeah. I'm going to ask you about that. And then we're going to try to make it make sense because it's just yeah. a lot going on. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah. Like, let's just... Put pause on the music for a second because right, right. that's amazing and congratulations on that and happy hour. See, she, she's not going to promote herself, so I got to promote it to you. Okay. You know, get the song. It's an amazing <laughs> song and all that. So exactly. tell us about while this is all happening at the same time, there's yeah. also this business component of you, certification from Yale School of Management, you know, all this going on. So tell us about yeah. your journey as a entrepreneur. Yeah. So I don't think I realized when I was younger that that was a thing, but I had always been an entrepreneur minded person. So I started like a headband business and started like a nose ring business. Like there were all these different things that I started because I wanted to see how can I make people happy and how can I help them live in their purpose? And that's always been the motivator. So I started the Die Doc Group, which is a consultancy firm in 2020, because I want to use the knowledge that I've gained to help people make safe spaces for Black and Brown people and other historically underrepresented people. And as I ventured out to do that, I said, I could do that or I could help my people, my community, and others really thrive in their callings and their dreams and help them fund those ventures. And that was a huge blessing for me because I got a lot of life from seeing people be able to function independent of other institutions and feel empowered Mm -hmm. to go after their dreams and the ways that they wanted to make a change in their community. And so... And and I have to just say, because it's a subtle shift, Mm -hmm. 
maybe as people hear that, but it's a significant one from having a focus and a target to say, I'm going to help people who want to make more majority culture, monolithic spaces more diverse and thus cater and target that group of people to then going, you know, actually, as important as that work is, and we're glad that some people right. are doing it, it needs to get done. I feel a calling to actually support the work of those marginalized groups and empower them and equip them and support them yeah. to actually be rooted in the context in which they want to, that they don't have to find another spot. And part of yeah. the reason why that's significant is not only because of who the target group is, mm -hmm. but let's just be honest, from an entrepreneurial standpoint, yeah. that also comes with a higher level of risk of yeah. how do you make that sustainable? Because mm -hmm. the groups with the larger entities and majority culture, they usually have the funding, right? Yeah. So tell us about that part of it and what happened as a result. Yeah, I mean, it, it's challenging, just like you said, because it's easy to stay where the budget is, right? The yes. budget helps to pay the bills, and it's real. You know, I don't want to take anything away from that. Mm -hmm. But I realized that the braver thing for me to do was to step out on faith. And so being able to help sustain and raise capital for Black and Brown leaders and other underrepresented populations has given me joy and it's been sustainable, which is great. I mean, mm -hmm. I will have been in business for four years and, wow. you know, it's tough for BIPOC led businesses sometimes to last season too. So I'm grateful to the Lord for that. And I'm still looking for ways to expand that business because I love the idea of being able to give jobs to our people mm. and see them flourish mm. in leadership positions because we gotcha. have everything we need to flourish in leadership positions. We've done a lot with a little. So getting even mm. more is like, what else can we do? It's exciting. Okay. So recognized by Radio One, boom, 30 under 30, right? You know, have this pedigree as an entrepreneur and artist at the Grammys and fun developing guru. Now help us make sense of how all of these different seemingly composite pieces like make sense with this new role that you've taken on yeah. as the president of the Witness Foundation. Yeah, that's a great question. I think that people, if they are willing to be open, can have more than one talent in one area hmm. of expertise. Maybe not everyone is interested in that, but I think that there is the opportunity to have that kind of capacity. And so hmm. being able to bring all of these experiences into my new role will help me to see those that we're funding with those kind of eyes, that they can't hmm. just be put into one lane. And, you know, the people okay. that we have, you know, helped to fund through our fellowship program at the Witness Foundation in the past. They have been multi-talented individuals. Mm. Others, they're not just into their area of expertise, but they're artistic themselves. Mm. And so I'm excited to bring that appreciation for being multifaceted into my role because there's already that appreciation there in that space there, but just continuing to expand that to see how can we get more creative and others involved in what we're doing and social enterprisers involved. Okay. And what do you think that those different components, I'm going to say you're a multi-hyphenate, right? That's what they call <laughs> these like folks that's like artist, songwriter, CEO, founder, president, y'all multi-hyphenate yeah. people. Yeah. In what <laughs> ways does that give us an insight about who Danielle is? Yeah, I think that gives the insight that I'm not afraid of being in multiple things at one time. I'm not afraid of, of us figuring out how do we all thrive, even though we're different. Mm -hmm. That's a big value of mine. And one of the things I love about the witness is, you know, you have some of us are Pentecostal, some are Baptist, some are Anglican, and we all sit in this space with the same goal with the same mm -hmm. values and things that we've agreed to 
and then the mission that we've agreed to. Mm. And so I am excited to join into that and bring my appreciation for that and to see how can we continue to invite other people into that because we all want a space to belong to. That's a desire. And so I think I can bring that. Beautiful. And let's just kind of rewind a little bit. We've referenced The Witness multiple times. And then there's The Witness Foundation. So tell us about what is The Witness and what maybe we start with The Witness Foundation. Yes. So um, The Witness Foundation, we focus on funding, training, and identifying Black Christian leaders. And so if you are a Black Christian leader, we invite you to be a part of our space. Because we want to see how can we help you take what you already have, all of your brilliance that God has endowed you with, how do we help you be able to walk that out without restriction? Because we've noticed that grant funding to Black leaders is typically more restricted than any other population. And so we want to start to cut at that because we know we have everything that we need in order to be successful in us. So that's what we do. I, I love that. Identify, train, and mm-hmm. fund. And fund, yeah. The next generation of Black Christian leaders. And why is that important right now? Because, one, like I mentioned, the funding gap is huge. Hmm. It's, it's just too wide. You have 90% of organizations that benefit our communities led by those that do not represent our community. Mm. And that's a problem. Mm. And so we want to help fix that by making sure that those that have the solutions and that are naturally embedded in those communities have the resources that they need to make a difference. Okay. I think I see the things coming together now, right? (laughs) So let me just see if I can put this together. So like Danny Peace is about peacemaking and Mm -hmm. shalom, which is, wholeness, restorative, bringing all of us together, mind, body, and soul. So she sees the scripture and says, I can't just talk about the horizontal. I have to talk about the entirety of the human experience, love, loss, you know, just issues, right? Mm -hmm. So then that gets put together with the founder and CEO of Didoc, who also needs to pivot from mostly trying to train majority culture spaces to be more inclusive, to say, you know what, we really need to focus on the actual leaders because those are the folks that are being left behind and we need to Mm -hmm. equip those. Then that gets connected into this bigger picture of the witness of saying this is a specific group, Black Christian leaders who need that shalom, who need the fund developing that I learned as a missionary from back in the day and as an artist. And I'm putting all that together. And now, boom, that's the president of the witness. You know, I couldn't have said it any better. That's it right there. (laughs) (laughs) There's another component to this partnership that I would be remiss if we didn't bring up, which is the partnership with the voices from our Daily Bread Ministries and the Witness Foundation. Tell us a little bit about that and why is it valuable for the Witness Foundation to partner with voices? What are some things that you have seen and, and that we can even contribute to this important work that you've been doing with The Witness? I love this question so much. Because when I revisit why Dr. Tisby transitioned from the American Reform Network into the Black Mm -hmm. Christian Collectives, it was because he wanted to give voice to the collective Black Christian experience. Mm -hmm. And that's beautiful. And he did that in 2018. So way before it was popular, he had Mm -hmm. followed that vision that God gave him. And so when I think, you know, back to those roots of wanting to give voice to Black Christians, I think of voices. It feels very natural that we would collaborate because it's so embedded in our DNA to make sure that our voice, our leadership is being amplified and being looked to as a suitable way to move forward and as a way to um, not only have influence on culture, but advancement in society we have something to say and we have something to contribute and it's meaningful and it makes a difference and we can't just keep it to our community because it is for the larger body. So I'm very excited about our partnership with Voices because it does feel so in our DNA. I love it. And, you know, it's so cool because it's been so much a part of our DNA that we've had 
uh, Dr. Jamar Tisby on. We've That's had right. Ali Henny on. <laughs> and now it was only right to bring you on to where you're from as well, because it's all been part of the family. We, you know, have partnered with Joy and Justice yeah. uh, Conference. And so we're excited to be a part of that. And also show up at some of, you know, past the mic. You'll yeah. be able to hear us and see us more with those things as well. So we're just really grateful for this partnership. And you do it with such grace and courtesy and prophetic vision. And we're so glad to be able to partner with you. Thank you. It is so mutual here. And there's one last thing. I mean, this 2024 is a year that is going to pretty much go down in the annals of your life, I'd imagine, because not only did you walk the red carpet at the Grammys, right? And, you know, you also decided to uh, tie the knot. Tell us a little bit about that. I did decide to tie the knot this year. I had the pleasure of marrying one of my best friends a few months ago, and we've been friends for about 10 years. Now, one of the things, you know, I do my research here, as you could probably tell, and... I saw this line and I just thought it was very beautiful in terms of the description mm-hmm. of he decided to pop the question when y'all saw Wakanda forever. This is like the blackest <laughs> story ever. <laughs> and he said, so we saw Wakanda forever and walked into forever together. <laughs> Did I write that? I don't even remember that. He wrote that. He wrote that. Gonna say, he wrote he that. Wrote okay, that. that sounds like him. <laughs> yep. <laughs> But y'all some artists, man. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about Josh. And what's it like for two musicians mm-hmm. to be, you know, married? Like, that's an interesting dynamic. Yeah. So, Josh, he and I met in college through the prayer group I was having at my house. Mm. And so we met Come through on, prayer. <laughs> and he was there every week that I had it. He never wow. missed one. Mm. So I got to see that. his faithfulness. And I would always try to hook him up with all my friends. I'm like, why Why don't y'all want to give Josh a try? I don't understand. And then I hit this point where I was making the new pivot in my life to doing music that was in a different space. And I talked to him about it. And I said, you know, I really want you to be a part of it. He said, absolutely. Like, I'm mm-hmm. on your side. I'm on your team. I got you. And so we went through that transition together. And... I just started to see him in a different way mm. and we would just sit and talk for hours. We used to sit and talk for hours in the library and eat cupcakes. So, you know, we just really had such a fun friendship, but I think when we hit that stage, I just saw him in a different light and I saw our similarities and I thought this is someone that I could actually see myself building a life with. And the way we process is similar enough to be challenging, but also we could get along. And so it, it was a little bit more time between then and when we actually got together. But yeah. I believe that even when I was not on track with God's will for my life, He protected me so that mm-hmm. I could come back and be able to marry the man that is the love of my life, you know, and I feel so comfortable with him. I trust him with my life. And I think that's very important to respect someone enough to know that they have your back in every way mm. that means something. And I love that. That's man. beautiful. And it's funny. You're like, why won't y'all give Josh a chance? It's like, God is like, look, that's your man. Right. <laughs> Stop trying to give him away. Right. <laughs> I'm like, oh my goodness, it was right there. (laughs) Yeah. Hey, everything in God's timing. Um, God's timing. Well, you know, this has been dope. I'm so glad that we got a chance to connect and and I know our our worlds orbited often in the past, but I'm so glad that we've got a chance in this season to really lock arms in ministry together and congratulations on what a year, right? I oh mean, married, <laughs> you know, witness, president, all these things. And I know it's just the best is yet to come. Amen. And I just want to say, Ross Tool, though I haven't always been able to tell you in those seasons of overlap because of my own shyness, you have been a hero to me. You know, I've mm-hmm. seen you at conferences and, and different things, and I watch you from afar really handle the things that I was walking through myself on a small scale, on a bigger scale. 
And so I'm really grateful for your witness. And you conducted yourself with such tact, respect, but also a commitment to the truth. And you didn't back down just because it was inconvenient and uncomfortable for some. And I really appreciate that. And though I never got to say that to you in those time periods because I was shy or time didn't allow itself, I really did admire you from afar and appreciated the work that you do and that you did back then. And so I'm really grateful to be sitting here with you, one of my heroes. So thank you for being that godly example and for giving some of us like some energy that we really needed to persevere in the season that God had called us to. This is where you're from. I'm Russell Berry. And remember, it's not just about where you're at. It's also about where you're from. This show was produced by Ryan Clevenger and Mary Jo Clark. Also want to thank listeners Katera and Crescentia for their help in supporting and promoting where you're from. Thanks, y'all. Where You're From is part of the Voices Collection from Our Daily Bread Ministries. This is a paid message from the 2024 Holiday Gift Guide for Book Lovers from CT Creative Studio. At Christianity Today, we believe in the miraculous magic of books, the power they hold to inspire our imagination and cultivate our creativity. Our lives often seem reduced to the flatness of a screen, but books, as author Anne Lamott says, remind us that world after world after world await us. This holiday season, we invite you to choose an adventure for each person on your gift list, from beautifully illustrated Bibles and devotionals to novels and picture books. This guide holds the perfect text for every reader, including yourself. Start your holiday shopping today. Visit ChristmasGiftBuyingGuide.com to browse our books.